So we will start off then. Uh, so we'll do the official patter. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jennifer Gray. I am the public services coordinator for FSCJ's Library and Learning Commons. And thank you for joining us today at Apocalypse Hell, the end of the world in cinema. Um, and many of you may have noticed uh, toward the beginning of this year when we all locked ourselves in our houses that you saw a lot of different things coming around to the internet, uh, articles about the best apocalypse films or the best apocalypse novels or all of that. So clearly it is in the zeitgeist this year to talk about this, but it is not at all a new preoccupation. Um, as far back as 1826, Mary Shelley, you may have heard of her, was writing a novel about a pandemic that wiped out the population of the earth. And as early as 1916, a Danish filmmaker named August Bloom was making his uh, own end of the world film, which was based on terror about Halley's Comet and uh, World War I. So it's a thing and it's been a thing for a while. And we thought we like to talk about that kind of thing. So we're gonna go ahead and kick it off today. Uh, we're gonna start today with Professor Woodward. Uh, Professor Woodward, if you can take it away. So welcome everyone. I uh, appreciate you joining us today. This is always a lot of fun to, uh, to do these things. But um, before I get started, I wanna thank Jennifer Gray, the wonderful, the very talented um, Jennifer Gray for, for setting this all up for us, getting us started, getting this idea out there, connecting with um, Dr. Pouts and Dr. Powell and, and me and pushing us along and reminding us that it's coming up and all that good stuff so that we can uh, share our ideas with you. And that's what I look to do right now. And now let me click this button. Let's see if this works. Can you just see the slide without the things on the side. Good. I see Jennifer shaking her head. Give me that paper. Sorry, I'm asking for my assistant to give me my my paper. So um, wonderful. Welcome. Apocalypse. Apocalypse is fun. Such a wonderful, fun conversation. Um, and in order to begin, what I wanted to do is to speak about the meaning of the word generally, to give sort of an overview and introduction to the idea. Um, talk about the meaning, where the word comes from, how the word's been used, and Jennifer's given us a wonderful uh, introduction into its usage in a more contemporary setting, including that 1916 film, which um, I don't believe I referenced, but I think I've seen clips of it. So I also wanted to dive down into, just very shortly, looking at two specific films. Uh, those films are Antichrist um, by Lars von Trier and Taste of Cherries. I don't have a whole bunch of slides to share with those, and really it's just giving some ideas for how to look at them. But let's start with Apocalypse. <clears throat> you may or may not know this, so if you do, my apologies. But Apocalypse comes from Greek, you may know, which uh, and the word means uncovering. That's what the word Apocalypse means, to uncover something. Obviously, this has a religious context, and in that religious context, what is being uncovered is some sort of true order of the universe. Could be the end of time, the end of ends, the end of death. A related, a related term to this is eschatology. <clears throat> I think I have that actually on the next slide. Yep. Eschatology, study of the end of the world. Um, eschatology entails a belief that one, there is an end of all things in which truth will be revealed. And two, one can determine from foreshadowing of this end and maybe even foretell it. Eschatological desire or a desire to foretell the ending of some order or structure of civilization is a large part of our histories, both real and imagined. It goes well, well deeper than the, um, than the 19th century. Deep down into the very history of civilization is this sort of eschatological desire. The desire manifests as a will to destroy a certain order, generally speaking, in order to reveal a truer order underneath the old order that was there. And there's a definite pleasure in this desire. We see it in Dante's Divine Comedy. Whoops, I flipped them around. There's the Divine Comedy. We see it in The Triumph of Death by Peter Bruegel. The image that you see in front of you, The Triumph of Death, Bruegel, 16th, I mean, uh, 1562, 
um, well-known painting. There's a couple of versions of it by him and his and his followers, sons. It's a little confused as to who painted the other ones, but wonderful painting to sit down and study at some point. Um, but I just wanted to show it to you because it's so awesome. You have skeletons. You have skeletons killing people. There's a skeleton who's cutting a guy's throat down there at the bottom. You have people playing cards while the world burns. Glorious. So, um, and then uh, Dante's Dante's Inferno, which isn't really about the end of the world, but it is about Dante's uh, character's end as he travels through hell to go up to ascend into heaven. So, movies have played with this, as uh, Jennifer pointed out, uh, has played with this idea of the end of the world for a very long time. Um, Kristen Thompson is a, um, it's a film critic, a film scholar. She points out an eschatological desire, as she calls it, in the 90s and in millennial films, films that deal with that transition. I don't know if we all remember that, but you know there was a big scare in 2000 that the universe was going to collapse in upon itself because we wouldn't be able to check the time on our computer or some strange thing like that. So she sees that in um, films that are produced just previous and afterwards, and a desire to see what is beyond that moment or to envision a future where our complex social world has been abolished. It's not a new concept in cinema, although uh, we could say there's some, some specific manifestations uh, in uh, fairly recent films. Cinema has long borne within it a desire for simplicity and a desire for a repetitious purgatory. Or, as Abel Gantz said back in the beginning of the 20th century, a hell of images. That's what he called the movies where the same narrative or the same plot is reborn again and again with new visuals, not abstractly, but really. And this is probably rooted in the fundamental molecule of cinematic production, which is, of course, money and its essential fungibility. This fungibility creates an unconscious anxiety, a layer of meaning we cannot approach without eradicating the structure of meanings on which so much of our understanding of the world is constructed. Meaning itself cannot be fungible. Items uh, that have no qualitative difference and are easily exchangeable one for the other are fungible. It's the definition of the word. While the central principle of film narratives is this hell of images is by its nature fungible. The dollar is fungible, is exchangeable for other dollars. It is this situation of circularity where the old is new again that leads Wheeler Winston Dixon to write, quote, we are experiencing a global cultural meltdown in which all the values of the past have been replaced by rapacious greed, the hunger for sensation and the desire for useless novelty without risk. Indeed, in all our contemporary cultural manifestations as a worldwide community, we seem eager for the end, end quote. And that's from his book called Visions of the Apocalypse, Spectacles of Destruction in American Cinema, which is pretty bleak. <laughs> He's very anxious. And he sees an anxious world where we have become shut in, glancing fearfully out of the windows now and again, then turning back to the comfort of our screens, fearful of anything that does not satisfy our immediate desires, becoming ignorant of the world to the world around us, as the parents in Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits are ignorant of the life led by their son. Indeed, perhaps ignorant of all life outside of their home while they rest glued to the screens. This is not a new critique of media, nor is it a new critique of life. Terry Gilliam's uh, films from 1984, I think. We could read this desire psychologically by seeing it as a manifestation of the Freudian death urge described in Melanie Klein. Essentially, the death urge is the desire to return to a radical mineral simplicity, a primordial form free of all contradictions and conflicts, all anxieties and internal problems. The only realm where this is the case is the realm of death or the realm of pre-life the earth, the mineral, the raw, organic. 
The urge sits at the dark heart of all conflicts and all desires. The Gordian knot is perhaps the manifestation of the urge in practical terms. Occam's razor in logical terms. Cupio dissolve. As St. Paul writes in Philippians, I wish to dissolve becomes I wish all to dissolve. All complexity is the enemy. All conflict can be cured with the total eradication of all life. We once had a concentrated fear to rely on, the nuclear winter. That was the moment we confronted daily, a moment that promised perversely the end of all life on the planet. It manifested in the nightmares of the Cold War, perhaps as much an ideological tool as a real collective fear. The film On the Beach is a thing of the past. We no longer seem to have the ominous fear of nuclear annihilation hanging over us. We have different nightmares. We like these nightmares in all their obscenity. Melancholia, by Lars von Trier from 2011, has to create a physically impossible planet passing the Earth then swinging back to ram into us. Marvel movies create supervillains to destroy hundreds of millions of people, mirroring the destruction of the world and on the beach, while also making the quasi-fascist heroes, as Alan Moore describes them, the saviors of the planet and its peoples. But the apocalypse is not one thing. It is rooted in a philosophical attempt to uncover some truth. That uncovering gets bound to the eradication of falsity. And so our world partakes in that falsity in a platonic moment. The world of our senses is but a shadow of the true world, beyond, so to speak. We can think of the apocalyptic film as a film that seeks to globally reveal, quote-unquote, some hidden order through the eradication of a given order. And we could also suggest that this can be a global eradication or a personal eradication. So here are some categories that we could consider in this. And I mean, this is not an extensive list of various categories of, of apocalyptic films, but um, I think we could categorize them differently in this way. It's one way. So we can have films about the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. Sorry. Um, Mad Max. Don't know why I didn't italicize those here. Uh, Delicatessen. I don't know if anybody's seen that one. Brilliant film. Uh, by um, Genet, a French filmmaker. We could have films about disease and death, which are also a type of pandemic world, right? Apocalyptic world, uh, like we have now. There are films where, and, and here we have some subcategories, which I think would be fascinating to analyze more extensively, and I'm sure someone has already. Films about disease where there is no solution. Seventh Seal is one of the great ones. Um, there's no cure to the plague for these characters. Uh, their death is inevitable, etc. Day of the Dead is also another one. And these are two distinctly different films, obviously. But those films that are about apocalyptic, um, the, you know, the apocalyptic zombie films, there's no solution to the, um, to the zombie apocalypse. And then you have the other uh, uh, pandemic films, films like Outbreak. Contagion, both of which are established on the fact that there is a pandemic, there is an a, a approximate um, revelation or uh, apocalypse that's going to happen, but there's also the promise that science is going to cure everything. At least that's the case in Outbreak. Contagion is a little bit different, but it's still there. You know, science is going to step up and, and fix, fix the illness for us as we kind of wait as, for the vaccines to come out. Um, as we are waiting right now. Uh, then you could have films about the end of the world physically. On the Beach would be one. Um, and I guess it's not the total global annihilation like you have in Melancholia. The Last World, um, The Last World, that should not read The Last World, that should read The Last War, The Last War, not The Last World. Uh, Japanese film, which is very much like On the Beach, and that is the film ends with everybody's dead. Yay. Um, that wonderful uh, apocalyptic type message. Melancholia, where the entire planet is destroyed. That's the more extreme one. 2012, where the planet is destroyed, but there's some special people who get to, you know, live and stuff like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you could also talk about films um, 
about the edge of civilization. Not quite the same idea of the destruction of civilization, but those films that are about the edge of civilization are there to, to do a number of things that are similar to the apocalyptic film, to effectively remind people, hey, civilization's not that bad. You know, you could have the xenomorph running around and eating your face or destroying, you know, ripping you apart on a limb. So, but on civilization so quickly. But I also would like to point to The Revenant um, as another example of this type of extremity where instead of the alien, you have nature itself is that uncaring beast that's out there ready to rip us all apart. And those have the similar type of revelation, the truth of nature relative to the lies humanity tells, we tell ourselves as human beings. Um, films that that often talk about, you know, nature has this raw truth to it that we like to pretend doesn't exist, but inevitably it overwhelms us. I think also fit into this type of apocalyptic film. So what I want to talk about as well to end my little moment with you here are two films, Antichrist by Lars von Trier and, as I mentioned at the beginning, and um, another film, Taste of Cherries, which if you've seen it, you would think, how in the world is that an apocalyptic film? But I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, Antichrist is, to, to sum it up, a crazy film. <laughs> it is... If, if you haven't seen it, it's pretty extreme, and I'm not advocating that everybody go off and watch Antichrist, certainly not if you have children in the household. That would not be a good decision. Um, it is, uh, it's based on, as you have the child here on the screen in front of you, a uh, child dying um, at, through an accident, what it seems like at the beginning of the film is an accident, while the parents are having sex with each other. Uh, so that creates a lot of guilt for the parents, one of the father, the husband is a therapist. And so you have this, this exploration of the woman's depression because of this. He's trying to cure her, trying to fix her, trying to understand what the problem is and trying to get her sort of quote unquote back on her feet. Um, and it descends from there. It gets a lot worse. So, but the apocalyptic moment that we see here is sort of this conflict between or this idea of the origin of life them having sex with each other and the child, death um, as the completion of life, the natural end to life. And we have that obsession with death that you see in all apocalyptic literature and apocalyptic uh, um, paintings that I was just showing you, um, that death is going to eradicate this order and reveal some sort of truth. But for the parents, they are left in the aftermath. And the husband uh, is attempting, played by Willem Dafoe, is he's attempting to find some truth, we could say, um, by reordering her, by bringing her back into his, uh, back into this binary unit of husband and wife and trying to kind of move, move beyond the event. Um, and she is unable to move beyond the event, and that leads to um, some of the gruesomeness that will end up happening in the film. But I think I have another image here. This I like to show as that moment of revelation, Willem Dafoe's character. These are acorns that are raining down. They rain down on the on this cabin that they go to in the middle of the woods because, of course, if you're really depressed, you should go into a cabin in the middle of the woods. That's pretty depressing. Anyway, um, that's that, that's where they go. They go to this place that just so happens is called Eden. Um, there's a lot of uh, Catholic um, imagery in the film. These acorns are life, they're the beginning of life. And of course, if you know anything about acorns, 90% of those acorns aren't going to make trees. And the trees that do survive, they're going to drown out the light from the other younger trees. And so there's this rawness that Lars von Trier continues to return to about the natural world and its limits and its hardness and its cruelty including, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to show the, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to show the, because I think I had a warning about videos not really working, Jennifer, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to show the, the chaos fox. There's a moment that seems to be a vision. Um, Will, Willem Dafoe's character seems to be caught up in a lot of visions about this cruelty and ugliness of the natural world, including a stillborn um, um, deer really gruesome imagery, and a, a fox that he comes across, which is 
in the process of eating its own decaying body. And then the fox raises its head and says to him, chaos reigns. And this this um, kind of stop motion imagery, it's wonderfully horrible. But the chaos reigns idea is, of course, associated with femininity. Women have a historical, all the way back down to the beginning of literature, have a connection to chaos. That's part of the patriarchal structure of civilization. Women are associated with chaos and, by extension, a source associated with nature. Men are associated with reason and rationality, etc. Um, the moment here that's on the screen is that uh, Willem Dafoe has sort of been buried alive, and she has felt some sort of sympathy for him and is now digging him back up. He's still alive, um, but unconscious. And so he's gone through death allegorically, and he's emerging. And what we what's revealed at the end of the film, the revelation, the apocalyptic moment at the end of the film, is that this simplistic narrative of her being chaotic and associated with chaos and nature and its rawness and all of that ends up being a total lie. And it, it's a subtle revelation at the end as Willem Dafoe is escaping from this gruesome, um, all of these gruesome events that have happened and he is surrounded by thousands of women, faceless women. Their faces have been digitally removed. They emerge out of the woods and they come towards him and the film ends. What's going on there is that this simplistic narrative of the woman being associated with chaos is a male crafted narrative that he is actually the problem in the film. She may commit a lot of the crimes, but he is the real um, evil at the heart of the film and his attempt to recreate her, his attempt to bring her back into the order that she and her chaotic uh, uh, life, we could say, is trying to eradicate. So he is preventing the apocalyptic moment from happening rather than uh, rather than embracing it and, you know, also saving his life at the same time. So it's a film that brings up a lot of these ideas, for example, the triumph of death, and the parallel idea, the triumph of truth. The triumph of truth in apocalyptic literature and painting and film comes from the triumph of death. Death happens, truth is revealed. Eradication of civilization happens, some sort of truth or natural order or what have you uh, is revealed, even if it's ugly and uncomfortable. So, Another, and the, the final little point that I want to bring up here, I don't want to drag us on too far because um, I could go on forever, but um, another film that I wanted to talk about was a film called A Taste of Cherries or A Taste of Cherry. It depends on how the translation happens. It's, a, it's an Iranian film by one of the greatest directors in all of history, Abbas Kairistami, uh, an Iranian director. And the film is a film that has nothing to do with apocalyptic destruction of the world. It's not even a part of it. Instead, it's a man who is looking for someone to bury his body if he decides to commit suicide. And he is driving around Iran. Um, I don't know what city they're in. It's really unclear. But he's driving around the town that he lives in. He picks up. He's looking to pick up some some workers. He says, I've got some money for you if you want to come do this. And he moves, he moves past them. He's un, he doesn't want them to do it. Eventually, he finds a young member of the military, picks him up on the, uh, he's hitchhiking to go to his, his uh, base. He picks him up and says, well, would you like to come with me? I'd like to show you something, ask you, ask you if you would do something for me and I'll give you money for it. And he tells this young um, member of the military that this is what he wants to do. He is thinking, he says, about killing himself. He has a hole dug. He wants someone to come along and bury him if he decides to do it. And the soldier says, no, I'm, he's not interested. And he ends up fleeing from the truck and running away from the guy. Um, he picks up someone else. They have a philosophical conversation. This man is someone who is um, Islamic and is getting into one of the Islamic orders and knows quite a lot about the Islamic religion and is trying to convince him and tell him that, you know, this is not allowed in Islam. And so he, he won't be able to help him 
to accomplish this. And so that conversation spirals down. And finally, he picks up a um, a man who works at a museum. And this man says, I don't want your money, um, but, you know, I will, I'll do it. I, it. He doesn't want, you know, he tries to convince him that this is not what he should be doing. And he, they have a long conversation. And, and at no point is the reason for why the main character wants to kill himself revealed. He gets close to it. That truth that's part of the revelation, part of the apocalypse, right? That truth is, is close, but then he doesn't go any further. And it ends up that all we're left with is that he simply wants to end his life for some, some reason. So this idea I want to talk about in order to get to that film, Taste and Cherries, and how it becomes some sort of a... a apocalyptic in some ways. And that is that all films are to some extent like that apocalyptic thing. They all end, and they end in a brutal way. They end without us having that human connection. If you have someone on a stage and the play ends, all of the actors come out at the end and they bow and they, you know, we all applaud them and you get to see the human being who was playing the character. Um, if you have a, a dance, um, all the same thing. Everybody comes out and bows, and you you recognize that you were part of a human performance. But in a film, those people just disappear. That's it. They're gone. Poof. Um, they are no more. And there's such a, a finality to it that is more brutal in many ways than other finalities. A book, you can skim back to that last chapter, and you can read it again. You can go back to the beginning and you know look for more details and skim around through the pages and get to know those characters a bit different or see those little secretive moments, etc. Whereas a film doesn't quite work that way. And on the stage, like I said, you see the human beings who performed it for you. The film, you know that those are human beings, but that's part of the, the magic of the film is they embody their characters so completely. And those characters are what kind of come to an ending. Um, so. This simplicity is, of course, reminiscent in many ways of that desire for simplicity that I mentioned when it comes to the um, death idea, uh, whatever that thing is called. Um, but I want to get now to the taste of cherry, the taste of cherries. There's that moment where he's this Mr. Body who's searching. There's the face of revelation. I mean, over and over again, Kairostami shows us the face which is the moment of revelation, right? You always have the face kind of being, uh, they, they see the truth. They understand the truth. We see their, them awakening to the reality, whatever it is. <clears throat> and that is sort of a rough equivalent in Taste of Cherries. But, and this is probably the most important point here, what Kairostami is doing is erasing the normal terminal quality of the film. He's erasing that sense of being left with nothing at the end, that sense of being of the ending itself, which is part of that moment of revelation. Because what he does is in the last five minutes of the film, for some reason, I think I, that this is the reason, he ends the film by showing video footage of the filming of the film. Um, that's Kai Rastami there. This is part of the ending of the official movie. Uh, and what he does is he has the videotape of him setting up a scene. We don't know, by the way, I should, I should mention this too. We don't know whether Mr. Body actually decided, and I don't know if that's an accidental thing. I don't know how to pronounce B-A-D-I-I. -I. I, I, my ear's not that good for, for Farsi. So, um, but it certainly sounds like Mr. Body to me, like English, the word body. We don't know if he ended up killing himself. That's kind of the catch in the film is that he says he's thinking about it. And we see him lying down in his grave that he has dug. And we see him looking up at the stars. And that's it. That's the end of we don't know if anybody came along and buried him. We don't know if he decided to kill himself. And he, he said openly, I'm not sure a number of different places. I'm not sure if this is what I'm going to do. I'm not sure if this is what I want to do. Well, what I want you to do is to come call out my name. And if you hear me say something, you know, you got nothing to do. You take my money, you go off. If you don't hear me, then you come and you bury me. And, and actually, the last one, he, he tells the guy, make sure you come down and poke me and because and, he doesn't want to be buried alive. 
But we don't know what the end is. Instead, we see Kai Rastami filming the work. And what this does is this eradicates that ending. It creates this lack of resolution, but also reminds us that there shouldn't be a resolution, that there is no apocalyptic moment of truth and revelation, that that is a part of the fictional order of things that we subscribe to anyway. If we even think that there's going to be some apocalyptic revelation of truth, we are already subscribing to an order that is going to take over that order that we are trying to get past. Um, and so the belief, the idea, this almost platonic notion that at some point we're going to come to this central truthfulness and be able to view it is, I think, what Kai Rastami is kind of reminding the viewer of is not really a possibility. Instead, movie ends. This is the way the movie is constructed. Uh, we have quite a bit of, of him showing a setup of um, filming some soldiers as they're uh, doing a, uh, uh, as they're jogging down the road. And, and that's it. It's the end of the movie. There you go. So the revelation, as I have here, this is my last little point, is not for him to decide. The revelation, the apocalypse, is for us to decide. And the order is, at the same time, for us to decide. There's no eradication of order. There's just the creation of more order. Thank you. Thank you so I'll much. While Professor Pouts is getting his slides set up, I will remind you all, thank you for coming. Uh, I have muted everyone, so we do not have any eating, phone calls, children, pets in the background. Luckily enough, you won't have to hear my cats because everybody's on mute. If you have questions, please do put them in the chat box and we will take questions at the end. And then it looks like, Professor Pouts, you are unmuted. Perfect. Okay, so right. I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, um, so um, where to start? Um, I'm going to sort of um, take uh, take some dispute with some of Dr. Woodward's uh, conceptualizations of um, apocalypse. So um, the root does come from uh, the Greek, which means to reveal or to um, to uncover. But to, um, to take sort of a different tack instead of the individual revelation in that sense, um, but look more at the purpose of what we would call um, in probably the wider culture, apocalyptic texts um, is something that we, if you say the apocalypse, people all of a sudden uh, generally automatically assume the end of the world or perhaps a little bit more nuanced end of the world as we know it, Tiwatwaki. Um, but we very often, can, we generally confuse two things, conflate two concepts when it comes to the apocalypse, and that is the apocalypse and the millennium and millennialism. And so millennialism is the social phenomena by which we are concerned with the end of the world. And millennialism goes way, way, way back in, um, <clears throat> in, um, in history. And these, the culture that um, is going to have the uh, probably the strongest current of millennialism is going to be the ancient Hebrews through Judaism, which is going to be um, basically as a matter of constantly being invaded, you know, 720 BC by the Assyrians, 530 AD by the Babylonians, then by the Greeks, then by the Romans, um, then by uh, the Islamic Caliphates, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and going all the way back to, um, while there are some Assyrian um, versions of the idea of the end of time, um, I will switch over to my slide at this point to um, talk about what the millennium actually is. Let's see. So, <clears throat> millenarian beliefs, according to the uh, one of the major theorists in this area, Michael Barkun, who also looked into conspiracy theories, which have a lot of very similarity to do with um, with apocalyptic um, ideas and millennialistic millennialist ideas. Um, millenarian beliefs are a form of explanation. They tell us why we are in the dreadful circumstances of the present. They also respond to the failure of a disintegrating society. They tell us that problems that appear insoluble will be dealt with totally, favorably, and summarily in the twinkling of an eye. Okay, so um, this basically means that we wake up at some point and we say the world tomorrow or the world today 
is not like the world we know. We are now in sort of unrecognizable territory. We might think of the um, this major change of everything as destruction. We might see it in a positive sense. Um, things were bad, now they're completely better. Um, but the issue of the relationship between millennium, which is this change for the better or for the worse, and apocalypse, is that we need someone to tell us the, the nature of the times we are in. And so that generally is going to be the person to whom that knowledge has been revealed. And so the final book of the Bible, for example, the book of Revelation, aka the Apocalypse of John. So John of Patmos has revealed to him by a higher power, this is what's going to be happening in the end of days before, well, there's a lot of interpretation. I think most of the contemporary secular religious historians are basically look at this um, not as something that's going to happen in the past, but was basically happening in the near future as covert Christian churches in Asia Minor basically would, would have had the revealing of teachings that would um, give give them a sense of what was going to be happening um, in for, for the second coming, the parousia, and so on. And so um, <clears throat> we need someone to basically tell us um, the meaning of the times we are in. And so this brings us to millennial scripting, basically a reading of contemporary events. Is this just another economic recession or depression, or is it economic collapse that will put us into a never-ending chaos? Is this just another war, or is it the war that will end all, all worlds or whatever else? Um, and what should we do? And so I came to this sort of um, area of research, I will say. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in South Louisiana, draw your own conclusions. Um, that I, I think it'd be a slight, um, not too much of an exaggeration to say many of my family members are a bit more religious than I am. Um, and in the early 2000s, following Y2K, around that time, there was the massive franchise of survivalism, um, Rapture Ready Christianity, the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye. Um, everyone was their own eschatologist and studying uh, Cyrus Schofield and um, basically uh, dispensational Christianity and so on. Um, and when I was at that point taking an anthropology of religion class, I asked myself, why would people be this eager for the world to end? Um, as apparently a lot of people in the um, late 1990s and early 2000s were. And when that then happened, we had to reach in to borrow from the ancient Mayans and come up with a 2012 um, <clears throat> uh, sort of um, vision for the end of the world from the Mayan apocalypse, technically millennium. And um, I remember still that also coinciding with the presidential election, my other area of int interest is um, militia movement, patriot um, movement, domestic terrorism in the United States. And I still remember um, gun catalogs and ammo catalogs basically saying, um, prepare for the apocalypse of 2012, because this was also na naturally each uh, possible election brings the possibility that um, the government will take your guns and then you can't have guns to resist the government taking your guns. So um, more or less, this basically um, leads us to, we need someone to tell us the nature of the times we were living in. And so um, one of the major theories of millennial rhetoric is um, millennialism is not sort of baked into every culture. Um, we need to have a concept, cultural concept of time as linear. Um, every time you have major revisions in compiling the Bible historically, whether it's the 1500s or whether it's the Roman Empire, um, Apparently, it's come up as a question, Should where does the book of Revelation fit in? And the general assumption has been, well, um, we don't know really what to make of this book unless you are a fixator on eschatology. I can get to that another time. Um, usually, it's going to be up-and-coming religions that feel oppressed by more dominant religions, and they say, oh, well, you know, the dominant mainline churches, they are you know, steeped in iniquity, they are not righteous, and they will be swept aside, and the revelation will be that now it's our time. But you need to get down to authority. That would be the authority of the minister. The minister 
basically was saying, look at what's on the news. Look at what's in the Bible. The Bible says pestilence, war, and famine. Now, if you can't find that, unfortunately, on any news channel any day, whether it's happening in Ethiopia civil war right now as of last week, whether it's famine or you know storms in Central America, um, it's a pretty it's a pretty safe bet to make. So we need a concept of time that if we have a beginning, we also have an end. If you have a Genesis, you need a revelation. We need a concept of evil. And that might seem like sort of a no-brainer, but that's tied intimately into the concept of time. Are things good today? Okay. Are they good relative to yesterday being bad or tomorrow being better? And so this concept of time, we need to think back to, um, to understand, compare our times to times that come, uh, is this worse? Have things ever been this bad? Are they, is it so bad they could basically perhaps not even get, um, get worse? And so we need someone to um, basically make sense of the sign of the times. This could be the crazy person on the street corner with the sandwich board that says the end is near, repent now, etc. Um, that might be an authority of one to themselves that we all roll up our windows and sort of creep by at the stop sign. But on the other hand, we um, what is the role of John of Potmos and his revelation? Well, um, he has a vision and he basically, in this sense, the the function of uh, revelation is to be a prophet, is to take that knowledge that has been revealed to you and then to pass it on as a sort of conduit to other people. Um, in a class I teach on the atomic bomb in American culture, um, I cover the novel um, um, Alas Babylon, in which the main character, um, <clears throat> Randy Bragg, um, basically is the charismatic authority. He tells people in his community that I have secret knowledge and that we're about to be in a high likelihood of nuclear war. How does he know this? Because his older brother, who works for Strategic Air Command, gives him a phone call with a code word they've agreed upon. And so in this sense, we have an analogy. We have the voice of God. We have the person who then says, oh, well, this is the signs of the time. Um, and then basically, um, this is how we need to act accordingly. Are we going to trust this person who could either be raving or giving us uh, valuable insight? That's where it comes into, is this person charismatic? Are they Jim Jones or are they a, a journalist? So um, <clears throat> when it comes to this issue of, um, of apocalypse and millennium, they, these movements have, um, we can divide them into two major categories, progressive millennialism, cataclysmic millennialism. In the United States, in our cultural history, um, probably the first two-thirds of American history or so, depending on how far you want, back you want to go, has been characterized by progressive millennialism. Things are good. They're getting better. This is the kind of thing you see in the first and second great awakenings. This is the kind of things you see with the ideas of um, of promoting Western expansionism and manifest destiny and so on. It's after the Civil War that we start to see cataclysmic millennialism. And millennialism was generally something that was um, obsessive originally in the United States for the Northern churches, um, the Northeast, the Yankee Protestants, et cetera, et cetera. The Southern churches during the um, time of slavery did not want to talk about any major social changes that um, not wanting to talk about social changes basically would mean that, you know, if social change would mean the slaves revolted and perhaps upset the social order. And so this was not just uninteresting. It was uh, actively snuffed out as a form of rhetoric, though it was definitely uh, co-opted by, um, by African-American com uh, congregations, including one instance in which um, a a religious leader among a slave congregation um, foretold people that they had seen a, um, they had, the truth had been revealed to them and that they saw the future. And the future held that at the end of time, um, blacks would become whites and whites would become blacks. And that was going to be the, um, the first becoming last and the last becoming first. So when we are in times of rapid social change, we need to figure out um, what's, what's going on. 
um, is if it's rapid social changes for the better, then it's a validation of what we're already doing in our society. If it's rapid social change that alienates us and means that we don't know up from down, we're in this sort of cultural or social vertigo, then we are being tested. And that idea of being tested is basically provides a cultural sort of narrative in such a way that we have to figure out, as Barkun points out, why are we in the circumstances we are in? Um, are the wicked going to be punished? Those people that are either oppressing us or not following by our guidelines of proper cultural behavior and so on. Are they going to be um, be dealt with? Are we? How much are we going to have to flex from our rigid cultural identity in order to um, basically uh, flex from our identity to still maintain our identity as being members of culture X on the exit part of this. And so these apocalyptic slash millennial narratives basically are a means by which we tell ourselves who we are and maintain our identity as members of a culture. So um, and when Jennifer um, basically proposed this the topic, um, I was thinking to myself, what apocalyptic film can I think of? Because I, on the one hand, I always get fixated on this difference between apocalypse and millennium. But on the other hand, I thought, well, what about The Road? That is probably the most depressing movie um, that definitely has the um, the apocalypse as the end, as in the common notion, even though the apocalypse is very rarely the end because we most of our genre of the apocalypse is the post-apocalypse. Um, the world we know it no longer exists. So now we're in Mad Max territory. But in going back to my... Um, you know, back when I did research, the um, <clears throat> um, the I my area of interest in publication was um, the militia movement and uh, far right extremist groups and their co opting of um, conspiracy theories um, <clears throat> to basically talk about um, um, the end of the world and the post apocalypse in which they will inevitably fight some form of a new world order, one world government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in looking at that sort of um, that idea, there are many, many texts. I was just on some chat board thing on Reddit or something like that a couple of days ago um, talking about, um, you know, the Turner Diaries and how uh, Proud Boy groups had been making references to um, basically mass slaughter of uh, anyone who wasn't a neo-Nazi, basically, in uh, the Turner Diaries, this uh, code phrase, the day of the rope, which hopefully we won't see too much bantering, but I guess if you go dig around in the parlor, uh, it's inevitable. Now, on the other hand, um, this idea of the Turner Diaries, a um, an apocalyptic novel for white supremacists that ends up inspiring um, the Oklahoma City bombing um, by Timothy McVeigh, um, what the... <clears throat> Um, what the Turner Diaries basically looks at is the instigation of a race war that will um, end up with the end of the world as we know it, a multiracial, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multinational world, and instead be one in which um, there's not a whole lot of um, emphasis on policy. It's just that once there's only white people, everything will be perfect is the bottom line of this book that Timothy McVeigh and apparently, unfortunately, um, our burgeoning neo-Nazi, uh, neo-fascist fascist, uh, movements are obsessed with. But interestingly, um, as I was writing my dissertation research, the Turner Diaries is not in a vacuum by a long shot. Um, instead, um, it actually, uh, if you want to look at the major players movement-wise in the what we would call the new right, basically, there's the Republican Party of Eisenhower, and then by the 1980s, with the implementation of the Southern strategy, we see the the traditionally pro-slavery, more pro-segregation Democratic Party flip flops by the late 1970s between Nixon and Reagan, with the Republican Party, and the Republican Party becomes the party of the South, and the Democratic Party becomes the party of the North, even though prior, prior to 1960 that was not the case. And yes, um, many people will throw out there that um, many prominent Democrats of the older age, like um, 
Senator Byrd from West Virginia were actually Klan members, even though they were also Democrats, even though we see the Democratic Party traditionally gets the uh, majority of, major of minority votes. Um, the This coalition of the new right is going to bring um, basically um, uh, a very strong religious conservative element, people like Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, etc., under things like moral majority, um, is going to be one leg of this sort of tripod. Then you have the big time money men, um, uh, Rich, uh, Richard Vigory, DeVos, um, 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 Nelson Bunker Hunt, a lot of other people um, are going to be the people who basically have billionaires that have the clout to bit and the Koch brothers, and you can go down the list. Um, people who, the Coors family especially, um, not to forget Adolf Coors. Um, and so basically they're going to have the money to build a political party, rebuild a political party from the ground up. And then the third leg of this tripod is going to be the various forms of militia movements, whether it is going to be um, the Klan that as a sort of um, millennial inspired group, anytime there is major social change, the Klan pops up, whether it is after the Civil War, whether it's during um, after World War II, or, sorry, after World War I with the Second Klan and massive waves of immigration from Eastern Europe or Southern Europe, or whether it is the 1960s with uh, desegregation, or then again in the 1990s. Um, uh, in which um, basically um, immigration from Latin America becomes the major um, boogeyman in the American far right. Now, one thing to point out is that these um, these types of groups generally go dormant during right wing administrations. And so uh, the biggest anomaly that a lot of people who track these things are paying attention to is that um, the last 10 years, but especially the last um, last current ending current administration um, has seen the first sort of um, backlash to that anomaly in which you actually see uh, militia groups uh, grow during a Republican administration. In other words, they kept on growing to the uh, Obama administration and didn't stop. Um, now, that those groups, on the one hand, the Klan is going to be part of the militant um, far right. Other major group is going to be um, more to the my point is going to be a group called the Minutemen. And what all three of these groups are going to have in common is that they are going to join up in a um, group that starts off in the late 1950s in Appleton, Wisconsin, called the John Birch Society. And the John Birch Society is going to have millennial rhetoric um, basically as its framework. Um, and what millennial rhetoric is going to go hand in hand with eliminationist rhetoric, in other words, uh, bl obliterate and remove your enemies, no sort of time, uh, room for negotiation or common ground or whatever else, is going to be that we have an enemy that is so horrible that um, their existence um, basically allows us to do um, to sort of get out of what we might call the revolutionary paradox. I know the quote is famously attributed to Nietzsche, but I think he probably got it from somewhere else. But um, the idea of when you fight monsters, don't become a monster. Um, don't become the evil that you claim to be fighting against. And so in this sort of understanding of when we, um, if once we completely eliminate everyone who is not on the same page of us, all of a sudden we'll be in this brilliant new uh, new future. We'll be over the hump and sort of over the horizon. We have a perfect world, a world that will never change. And that is usually the, um, the major premise of millennialism. Um, now, what is the nature of this? How is the nature of this millennial revealed to someone? Well, it's been revealed to a lot of people, whether it's Christ talking about the kingdom to come or the kingdom of heaven on earth, whether it's uh, George Frederick Hegel talking about eventually all cultures will clash different ideas to produce one sort of monoculture, um, whether it is Marx that basically takes the same thing, but instead of saying clashes of ideas, it is clashes of classes, or Francis Fukuyama who says, oh, well, you know what, we, we fought communism, we won, and so therefore we are now in the end of history. Things are gonna be perfect, they're gonna keep on keeping on, and we are in a timeless future. And each one of these people ends up being proven dreadfully wrong in the most in general. And so, um, yeah, Marx did not have his um, his millennium happen, at least yet. 
um, friends of Fukuyama um, ends up falling into the exact same thing. And so the understanding is that once you eliminate those people that fall into whatever group you are against, um, then everything's going to be peachy after that. Well, the John Birch Society thought that everything that ever happened to um, basically perhaps put the uh, United States to trip up the United States was the matter of an eternal, um, had always been their communist plot, something you would put under a either systemic conspiracy theory or a super conspiracy. Um, not that, you know, uh, an event conspiracy would be, oh, maybe there were two gunmen shooting at um, Kennedy. A systemic conspiracy would be maybe there are elements in the government trying to overthrow the government over decades. Um, a super conspiracy is sort of like aliens bred us on this planet as a sort of uh, slave race, um, X-Files mythology type thing. But um, what the John Birch Society basically says that every sort of thing that against goes against their narrow understanding of what Americanism is, um, whether it is the civil rights movement, whether it is the, the fact that the United States losing uh, or declaring a stalemate in the Korean War or losing the Vietnam War, um, that all these things just cannot be happening. Happening, The government has to be controlled by um, nefarious forces who are forcing us to screw up um, on behalf of foreign masters. Which brings us to a subset of, um, and so the John Birch Society basically writes a novel, epistolary novel, letters going back and forth, but you only see one, one side of the letter that so brilliantly controls the conversation. So Turner has a diary, John Franklin has letters from his uncle where he tells his uncle, oh, this is how horrible all these things are uh, that are happening in the United States. Landlords are forced to take in uh, people um, of different races, whether they want to or not. There's busing, there's uh, welfare programs, um, et cetera, et cetera. All, and so basically, the Turner Diaries basically takes this earlier John Birch publication and revamps it. Interestingly enough, you see a lot of the same scene-by-scene -scene things in the first couple of the Left Behind books. Well, this brings us to um, a, lar a subset of apocalyptic literature, millen millenarian literature called invasion literature. And that is that um, if our society is invaded by another society, um, the end of our society is definitely something that borders on the apocalyptic or millenarian. We were doing our own thing and now we're under occupation. And interestingly enough, if you have been following news for the last five years, one of the interesting tropes in invasion literature is the idea of the quote-unquote invasion without a shot, the insiders, the people who somehow get a sort of toehold in the American government and destroy it on behalf of a foreign adversary from within. It may sound a little bit familiar. So um, one of the, um, so this idea of, um, of the end of our society, um, I figured I would um, talk a little bit, not too much, um, bring up something that if you grew up in the 80s, this is part of the collective pop culture, but at the same time, this is uh, something that becomes a foundational text, a text that gives meaning to a social movement um, that whether it is officially acknowledged or not, whether it is um, left behind for, um, you know, uh, certain elements of the uh, rapture-ready Christian movement in the, at the turn of the millennium, whether it is the Turner Diaries for neo-Nazis. Um, when something makes the leap from something that is uh, cliquish within a particular set of religious denominations, or is only going to be distributed at tax protest or white supremacist meetings, or something that's going to basically escape a subculture within a subculture, when you take something and you make it into a big picture, uh, big budget Hollywood movie, and you put half of the Brat Pack actors, including Swayze and um, and Ralph Macchio and, oh, um, <clears throat> uh, Charlie Sheen, who else am I forgetting? I'm talking about Red Dawn. And so... Um, a handful of red-blooded American teenagers can practically single-handedly defeat um, 
a highly unlikely. Uh, Emilio Estevez was in it also. Um, okay. And so this um, highly unlikely, um, you know, shooting down of Soviet helicopters, how they got here, who knows? Those transport ships must never have been spotted getting across the Pacific Ocean, right? Um, and um, paratroopers coming in from Cuba or whatever else. But this becomes basically, if we want to uh, see how the ball gets rolling from um, in the 1990s, um, people talking about being oppressed by black helicopters and being um, put into FEMA camps and other things like that. Um, on the other hand, how do we get from there to people threatening to kidnap the government, governor of Michigan and um, basically taking automatic weapons into the state house in Michigan and other states? Um, that movie is going, no matter how much it is a teenage flick, um, that movie is going to basically um, be a sort of manifesto. This gives, no matter how ludicrous it is, it gives credit to the idea that a few people that are basically living off the land can, um, can you know, take on a massive military. And that once this final fight is over, then everything's going to be um, idyllic and peaceful and beautiful after that. Um, <clears throat> so we we live in a culture that is deeply, deeply steeped, not only in apop apocalyptic millennial rhetoric, but also in that particular type of whether we call it um, having to fight off the new world order or uh, foreign occupation or foreign occupation from within or realizing that our society has changed in ways that we no longer approve or recognize. So today's America is not the other America um, that we remember. Um, these are very, very potent forces in the political consciousness. And we've been seeing what happens when not only these um, people being primed for these sort of narratives, going back to this idea of the authority is the person who um, looks at what's happening in the newspaper, looks at their millennial script and basically compares these two and says, oh, well, I'm expecting that, um, you know, they're going to they're going to start. You know, um, they're they're passing gun control laws. They are making us wear masks. They are making us, um, you know, uh, stay home from work and quarantine. Um, and so the next thing I can guarantee they're going to put us on trains and send us to FEMA camps and abandoned Walmart parking lots. So now's the time to pull a McVeigh or to kidnap the governor or other things like that, because no matter how irrational to someone who isn't steeped in this culture, other people's culture may culture may often seem strange or ludicrous to us. But if you are, if you do take these assumptions as givens, then however irrational we might think that is, it becomes rational to say, I need to act before my window closes. And that puts us in the contemporary time at very, very um, dangerous precipice. Um, it's depending on massive social change, uh, changes in gender roles, class consciousness, um, race relations, etc. all this stuff that is not happening slower, but only happening faster and faster and faster. Um, I guess my closing thought is that whether it's at something, um, you know, we, we have a lot of apocalyptic type films that have been, they've been with us for a very long time. But in the early 2000s, we saw whether it was the Matrix or Harry Potter or um, Hunger Games or you go down the list. Um, everything is a very, very polar world. There's good people. There's bad people. And one shall extinguish the other. Um, we're in a time where on the larger, wide culture, we are primed for this kind of rhetoric. Um, subcultures are very definitely primed. And the more things change, the more people sort of um, experience a form of cultural agnosia, of not recognizing, just as you can say, the sort of the invasion of the body snatchers type idea. I recognize you, but you're not who you're supposed to be. You're not who, you're, who you say you are. We have the same thing to our own national culture. America, I know, is not the America I knew. Um, and so to the extent that we have these rapid changes, the issue is the the world is the is the it's the end of the world as we know it soon for 
someone. And to what extent will they act? And I'm talking about not individuals necessarily, but cultural groups. Um, to what extent do we perceive um, the world no longer functioning according to the rules and assumptions we ha have been socialized to? So that's my song and dance. Hopefully I didn't go over time. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. And I'm going to switch over presentation mode uh, to <laughs> Professor Powell, who's our final speaker. <clears throat> But it looks like Professor Powell is ready to go, so take it away, sir. Thanks for having me, and um, hello, everybody. I appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm at the Deerwood Center, and it's a little bit desolate here. It uh, feels a little apocalyptic, but um, in terms of uh, this discussion, I'll try to be brief here. Um, throughout life, I think we learned the most about ourselves during those moments of duress, um, and we've had a few of those in, in 2020. So these are some strange transactions, of course because humans are remarkably adaptable. So we make these necessary daily adjustments um, to our lives and we go about navigating our days. And all the while we channel our attention away from this existential crisis that's looming in the background. Uh, in 2020, this crisis emerges in the form of COVID-19. Uh, in years past though, we've seen it with uh, moments of nuclear tension, natural disaster and fears about technology. And uh, both Dr. Woodward and, and uh, Dr. Potts kind of alluded to Y2K, but there was some pretty serious existential Read concerning Y2K in the year um, 2000. And uh, that fear about technology, I think, permeates a lot of what we're doing now with social media, and that, that uh, blends into some of these films too. But um, there are many, many intelligent people that are arguing we're now experiencing the lived effects of climate change, which I think is a, another existential threat to our species that deserves its own careful scrutiny, and probably a much larger, much more thoughtful, and much more coordinated response than we've seen even for coronavirus. Um, you know, folks are talking about uh, we've had the most number of named storms. We've seen these terrifying uh, wildfires throughout Washington, Oregon, Utah, Idaho, California. Um, so this this uh, there's no no shortage of grist for the mill on this subject. But um, apocalyptic storytelling is a subgenre of our horrific narrative tradition that dates back to the very beginning of oral speech. When early humans issued warnings and, and taught lessons on the perils of daily life. Uh, it's particularly unsettling from a dark storytelling form of dark storytelling, excuse me, uh, because for every positive step that our species takes moving forward, the human imagination has that uncanny capacity for visualizing the negative ramifications of those actions. You know, there's a movie that you can rent right now called Love and Monsters, where an asteroid's hurtling toward the Earth and they shoot warheads up there, the warheads disintegrate, send a chemical back down, and it mutates all the animals uh, on the planet. And that's blowback, right? We we're trying to do something scientific and positive by blowing up this asteroid, but it ends up having negative ramifications. So um, in terms of my take, uh, I did want to acknowledge the fact that um, we do have Pat Frank here. And um, in terms of, um, there's an image of Pat. Um, Pat Frank, in terms of the, the, the narrative tradition of the apocalyptic tale, he was right down the road in Atlantic Beach, uh, and in case you've never read his popular 1959 novel, A Last Babylon, I'll share one short little passage with you. I'm quoting here directly from the novel. Uh, the teller printer chattered again. PK to circuit, big explosion in direction of JX. We can see mushroom cloud. PK met Palatka, a small town on the St. John south of Jacksonville. Florence rose. I'm very sorry, Mr. Quisenberry, she said, but I can't send this. Jacksonville doesn't seem to be there anymore. Um, it was a chilling snippet for me when I first read the novel. It still kind of gets to me, um, you know, when I've encountered it in recent years. But I think at least part of the reason that we're drawn to these tales is that sense of their universal plausibility. Stephen King, when he was asked about the specter of nuclear destruction, had some interesting things to say on the subject. He recently gave an interview to Salon Magazine, and he said, quote, uh, when he was asked about what the biggest threat to the 21st century was, he said, uh, nuclear weapons, no doubt about it. There are days when I get up and I say, I cannot believe, I cannot believe that it's been more than 50 years since one of those things got popped on an actual population. There are too many out there. One's going to get away or someone will make one from spare parts and put it in a knapsack and blow it up in Bombay or New York or San Francisco. And so um, King, of course, has an uncanny knack for picking at those scabs of the human psyche that relate to the apocalypse. Uh, he actually uses a form of the avion flu, which he calls Captain Trips or A6 in the stand to decimate the world's population. Um, there's been some pretty good graphic representations of, uh, of uh, the stand. So I think on one hand, we're drawn to these stories because of their macabre plausibility. We see North Korea testing missiles on the evening news, and it isn't such a far jump to the chilling, underrated 1984 film, Threads, which you can actually look at right now on Prime. Um, it's got like an 8.4 rating on IMDb. It's really well made. It's a Mick Jackson BBC film from the early 80s. It's terrifying. Um, it's about nuclear apocalypse, but it's also about those subtle moments of, of humanity emerging from those 
uh, from that rubble. So um, if you go to YouTube, you can actually look at some of it on there too. And um, you'll see the kind of stunning cinematic mayhem that shook audiences to their core about 40 years ago. That film still feels relevant. Um, it's a terrifying notion that that's still the case. In the bombing scene that uh, you can find right now on YouTube, director Mick Jackson depicts the careful, measured human response of the frenzied, chaotic escape um, that would but that would accompany such an attack. So you see people doing the mundane things at the same time that they're gearing up to, to run away. Uh, and it's this de depiction, too, that draws us to the apocalyptic film. I think deep down inside, we all believe we'd be the ones who would survive that, right? We'd be the ones who'd get away. We'd be the ones who'd be able to remake uh, civilization. For almost a decade before it went way south, AMC's The Walking Dead was one of cable television's most popular shows. Uh, the special effects are great in that, but I think it's also that allure that stems from the questions that we'd pose if we face similar circumstances. Should we avoid going into the city? What about an island? Can those zombies swim out here? Should I join up with this group or should I simply go it on my own? I mean, those are those interesting questions. So these are hypotheticals that have jumped off the screen and into our lived experience. A recent LA Times news story dated March 16th, 2020, reports that Costco warehouses throughout Southern California had sold out on their ReadyWise emergency food buckets, which were filled with freeze-dried foods and survival equipment. There are cottage industries that have sprung up around the sale of furnished survival bunkers, some of them a quarter million dollars. And we all, I'm sh I am sure, remember that panic buying that took place uh, over water and paper products. And I think that's going to come back, too. I think that you know we're already seeing some panic buying in this second or third wave of the COVID experience. But it's not just the engagement with the hypotheticals that intrigues us as a culture. I'm convinced of this. It's also the overt challenges that these subjects present to our sense of mobility and personal agency. Uh, British author J.G. Ballard wrote this really underrated apocalyptic novel, High Rise. Uh, and there's this, another shot from Threads, which, again, has some really terrifying images in there. But J.G. Ballard had a wicked sense of humor, and he was always uh, writing about technology and how it would lead to devolution. Uh, you take evolution, throw a D in front of it, and you've got the opposite, right? We devolve. Um, and High Rise was a really interesting novel. Uh, he takes the audience on this trip into madness by presenting this high rise where it's got a school, a su supermarket, swimming pools, daycares, a health spa, but it devolves into class warfare as the technology in the building starts to fail. It's a symbol of making it, right? The top rungs of the socioeconomic ladder, but the genteel slide into chaos and barbarism toward each other as their tools fail them. They revert back to this hunter-gatherer approach to accumulating resources and paranoia reigns throughout this high rise. Uh, ben Wheatley's 2015 film adaptation, I think is pretty effective, uh, captures the desperation felt uh, by these characters that are trapped in this hellish nightmare of isolation and confinement. And I think that's one of the things that, that scares us, whether it's um, Escape from New York, where they put up a wall around New York, or Land of the Dead in 2005, where all the rich people live in this beautiful high rise while the zombies are out amongst the norms who are in the lower economic stratus below. That idea that we can't go someplace where that we want to is is horrifying. Uh, if you think about our expansion, westward expansion, or that that uh, idea of the open road in, in American culture, right? Um, unchecked mobility is a horrifying idea, and we're seeing that now. We're seeing people literally. Uh, we're actually seeing that 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 now with people protesting stay-at-home orders in certain states. So. Um, another great example of that would be um, The Mist. Um, Frank Darabont, my favorite director of all of Stephen King's different works, did a good job at the 2007 film, one of the greatest downer endings in Hollywood history. In The Mist, you've got this government experiment that's gone awry, um, this idea that the, that the 1950s Avon testing mutated some animals and opened up a, uh, or mutated a mist and opened up a door where animals in this mist could come into a different uh, dimension. And uh, this government research project that goes awry, it traps a bunch of um, characters, this combustible combination of different folks from different religious and socioeconomic backgrounds in a supermarket. And so the apocalypse strikes these people in the place that's most mundane. you got that Muzak playing in the background. Everything's sterile and shiny, and there's millions of different products on the shelves. It's literally the symbol of, you know, uh, capitalism. And the thing that attacks them and, and traps them there. Um, it's it's visceral. So um, his his film adaptation of the no, uh, of the novella Darabont does a fine job of capturing that sense of tension in the form of their confinement. There's this one scene where a few stock characters make a break for it. They run out into the mist, and they're eviscerated by these unseen monsters. Um, that's another interesting uh, piece from High Rise. But um, you know, King I think is one of the better uh, one of the better artists of the 21st century uh, and the 20th century at picking at that scab of how this stuff might happen and what it might do to us. 
Um, there's a moment also uh, in uh, George Romero's wonderful film, Night of the Living Dead, that kind of uh, plays on some of the same roles. Instead of a, a supermarket, though, it's a mall. And um, there's one of the creatures from The Mist. Um, the characters are a little overwhelmed there. But Dawn of the Dead, um, you know, uh, it predated Darabont's film by 30 years, but much of the horror that it presents is similarly epitomized in how it shows confinement. Romero's groundmaking film, Night of the Living Dead, from 1968, takes place in rural America. Uh, but this one actually takes place inside, uh, you know, a mall which features the, you know, the idea of corrosive capitalism. This band of survivors barricade themselves in the, inside of the mall while outside of it, um, you know, they're besieged by zombies. And there's this moment of tension where they say, why are they coming here? Here's a quote from the film. Francine, what are they doing? Why do they come here? Stephen, some kind of instinct, memory of what they used to do. This was an important place in their lives. So it's this understanding of the zombifying powers of commodity fetishism that drives the story's apocalyptic message about the evils of consumption. In this important scene late in the film, the central characters go on a virtual shopping spree. They do what every kid who's ever thought about spending the night in the mall would do. And they go and they buy it. They take everything off the shelves and they're having a great time. Uh, but then they burn themselves out and then they realize, and here's a quote from Francine, the mall is so bright and neatly wrapped that you don't see it's a prison too, right? This notion that we're consumed by our things. So this is getting long. I'll wrap things up. Um, we see these themes and tropes concerning the horrors of isolation and confinement again and again in apocalyptic tales. 2005's Land of the Dead, which I just mentioned. It's even evident in the apocalyptic Mad Max films. Uh, another shot there from Dawn of the Dead. Um, which fetishize hot rod culture, at least for those such as Immortan Joe, who can afford a fancy vehicle uh, while his war boys subsist underground, toiling in servitude. They're shackled. They can't get out and see the sun. He gets the hot rod. They have to work in caves. Um, and so what I'm saying here isn't necessarily profound, but it's this idea of unrestricted mobility and the freedom of the open road that epitomize the human spirit and are up for, for grabs in a lot of these things. Um, there's a sizable kernel of truth in it. Since March, we've seen public demonstrations and riots and overt antisocial behavior over stay-at-home measures. So people are tired of being cooped up, and perhaps that's one of the telling lessons that we can take from some of these stories. Um, apocalyptic storytelling gives us a lens through which to glimpse, you know, the human condition, to act as a voyeur into the lives of others. Um, it's both subtle and profound sometimes, these narratives uh, which duly deliver on the promise of the definition of the term apocalypse. And roughly translated means lifting of the veil. Um, these, these films thrill us, of course, uh, with their explanations of survival, and they humble us with their messages of human persistence. Love the road for that reason. Just the whole idea of getting to the, to the beach. There's no other purpose but just to, to accomplish something and pass something along to the sun. Um, they also serve as cautionary tales, though. But from a wholly humanistic perspective, these narratives speak to a future of confinement and isolation across physical, social, and mental thresholds. And in doing so, these tales reinforce what it means to cherish community, personal mobility, and human connection, right? We watch those films, and then we don't take for granted some of those things that the film depicts. You know, in the case of, uh, of uh, Mad Max, it's water at the beginning of the film. So, but that's it for me. Um, I'll just leave you with an image of Mount Hood. Uh, that's from my home state of Oregon. Mount Hood symbolizes the beauty and the bounty of nature for me, so it's nice to see such a breathtaking vista after all this uh, depressing talk about confinement. It's also probably, ironically, a location I might take my family in the event of a zombie apocalypse if we have to stow away. So um, I appreciate everybody for listening, and uh, thanks for being here today. All right. Thank you so much. Um, again, if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat. I will very quickly start off with one question for our panel so that you guys have a chance to type if you want to. And we'll start with Professor Pout. Same question to all of you. What is your favorite end of the world film? Okay, um, Dr. Strangelove. Interesting, good choice. Very fun. Uh, Professor Powell, what about you? The road. Road, all right, so going for the bleak, super bleak, uh, Professor Woodward. It's a very, very good question. I guess out of sort of a raw childlike pleasure, um, any of the Mad Maxes, I always enjoyed those. Um, but I, I don't know. It's it, whenever anybody asks me what's your favorite film, I lock down and I, I forget everything that I've ever seen. And it's because all the films that I see are in some ways my favorites. So, of course, of course. All right. So I do not see anything in the chat. I will give it one more minute, and I have one more question for you guys. Just if you have a chance. So M R Carey, who wrote the Girl with All the Gifts, has an excellent <laughs> article online where he talks about how uh, every sort of decades or eras, apocalypse 
films sort of reflect the very obvious societal concerns of that time. And so I was kind of wondering, um, obviously it's sort of a weird time right now. What do you picture the apocalypse films of the next 10 years looking like after this? I think I think there's going to be a lot of this goes back to last year's discussion on Get Out, but I think there's going to be a lot of, um, of of notion about the contested idea of identity, and and it would be an apocalypse, right, to even lose sense of yourself, whether that's through dementia or Alzheimer's, but um, some kind of idea of you know the, the the biotechnical human, the transhuman, and some kind of cascading apocalypse where we you know become less than ourselves, robotic in some sense. Uh, I think I think technology is the threshold that will continue to see this stuff contested. And I, you know, the idea of losing your sense of humanity, I think, is where I, I would predict this stuff would go. Um, I would probably go with um, the political. I mean, we have the man in the high castle. We have mm -hmm. um, other uh, other um, sort of made for TV type narratives. But I think we're probably going to see something about um, fascism, crypto fascism, something like that. Did you guys ever see the season of um, American Horror Story that that parodied? It was the 2016 season, I think the seventh seventh season, where they talked about the Trump election. The whole season was about the Trump election. It was it was crazy. I've only got seen the first two seasons, maybe three. I can't remember. Yeah, American Horror Story is on Prime right now. That particular. Yeah season uh it's completely politically shocking dr woodward did you have uh something you wanted to chime in with there if not have a question in the chat i think that the uh the um comic book movie the comic book show the boys is actually an interesting an interesting thing is probably going to take off, and that is, I think we've reached a saturation moment with the whole heroes, uh, pure heroes thing, and, and Alan Moore's critique of them is actually from, I think, the mid-90s or something, when he said, look, these are basically fascists. Why do you, why do all of you love these characters? <laughs> these are Nazis. Um, and so I think that that is finally starting to kind of take root, and it, it becomes a matter of sort of taste, right? The comic book movies are saturating the market, and eventually that saturation is going to lead to, yeah, not so interested. Then a, a you know a Spider Man movie is going to make a bit, yeah, a three hundred million dollars rather than a billion, and then they're going to cut cut the tent pole on that one and and maybe rebirth it in in some sort of deeply critical or dark way. But um, but yeah, and I think I, I'd like to also talk about this idea of there being you know the apocalypse is a lens on us and our particular. Our particular situation. I think that looking at the apocalypse and as Dr. Pouse talks about sort of millennial ideas um, from a lens that is not Western is actually pretty interesting because it reveals some consistency in our Western obsessions of the apocalypse. A consistency that is generally there is rich people are the ones who should die and poor people end up becoming the heroes or are saved in some way. And the rich people are oftentimes the enemy. Uh, you know, how many Stephen King novels have, you know, the rich person is the one you got to kill. Please kill that person because they are going to sell you out in some way or they're going to run out the door and close it behind you and the zombie's going to get you whatever. But as an end point, I would just like to eventually get beyond the zombie apocalypse as being the de facto apocalypse. <laughs> I mean, I like them and I, I, there's, there's fun in them, but we've got to come up with other apocalypses now. It's a bit played out, yeah. All right, so we have had a super active chat, if you haven't been following over the panel there. Um, and we do have two questions very quickly. Uh, somebody is asking about the Book of Eli in particular. It says it hits on multiple topics that have been touched on by the panel. And do y'all believe that the biblical overarching theme is the focus or the social contract on morals that the Bible provided to humanity? Uh, Ryan, I don't see right. the Book of Eli, uh, so I have to abstain from that one. So it's been a while since I've seen it, but I think mm -hmm. that taking away from it originally, the uh, the social contract idea, I mean, there's, as happens to it's quite often in contemporary cinema that deals with religious you know, premises, the religion kind of disappears into a natural order in the background, um, and the human beings sort of play off on it as uh, kind of a, a, an old-fashioned uh, free will type of um of narrative or discussion or theme or what have you. And so I think that the real kernel of that film and others that deal with sort of similar narratives or similar themes is that 
human social unity is what transcends. I mean, we have a lot of films that focus on individual and Mad Max, right? You better be an individual to take care of yourself. But Mad Max, he saves people. I mean, that that's kind of the it's an individual, individual, individual. Oh, I guess I'll save some people. That is rooted in the spaghetti westerns, too. Clint Eastwood's an individual, individual, individual. Oh, I guess I'll save some people because I'm more moral than the moral people here. And you get the same theme that pops up, if I remember correctly, in um, the Book of Eli with um, – Oh, shoot, I can't think of the actor's name now, but uh, Denzel. Denzel Washington. Yes, thank you. So so I, I think it's a it's a narrative that's been there from the 70s in, in American films. Spaghetti Westerns, I guess, are technically Italian. But that sense of the individual, powerful individual, normally male, dynamic figure. Uh, he's an individual, but you know what? He's going to hold civilization together on his own. Not because he wants to, but because there's some sort of moral value in doing that in and of itself. So that's my memory of it. Yeah, it's been a while too, but that's a good movie. And Denzel, um, he plays that that social contract role really well in so many films that he that he stars in. But there was a sense of solemnity and gravity in the conclusion of that film. It was like it was kind of like the road. Like you, once you got to the end and he and he delivered the book, there was this prophetic quality and the big reveal is that he's blind, right? And so I think it does a little column A and a little column B. I think there are theological overtones. And then there's also the last Bible of Earth, right? Those theological overtones. So there's that prophetic quality that he is, uh, you know, fulfilling there. But it's also the social contract of trying to teach along the way. That's what happens with the road, too. Like, he's trying to tell his son, we're the keepers of the fire throughout the way. And the son says to the dad, you know, well, I wouldn't do that, would we? Um, when they talk about cannibalism, he says, no, because we're keeping the fire. That social contract of we won't devolve is there. But I think, again, there's a lot of theology uh, involved with the book of Eli. I, it kind of was two films for me and at the conclusion, which was good. The big reveal, I thought, gosh, uh, this is, this is really kind of a different, different piece. Didn't feel overtly religious until the conclusion. And Ryan, I, I really like your point. Yes. Um, it would have been a good idea to just stop by a printing press and print off a couple of copies. <laughs> no key goes in, <laughs> in the end time. <laughs> Um, but I actually, um, Dan, I wanted to talk a little bit about the road because I think what I see there too is the keeping the fire becomes this. Um, and I don't, I've truthfully never read the novel, so I don't want to Beautiful. talk about what's in there. But and I don't know how close the film is to the novel. But I think that you have a kind of a similar theme that emerges in No Country for Old Men too. And that is that there is a naturalness to some civilization concepts mm -hmm. and that the father there is like I mean, <laughs> trying not to keep, you know, make it too vulgar here, but he's like the sperm delivering the genetic information that's going to possibly die on the road before it gets there. Right. You, 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 it's, it's this natural sort of principle of production of a whole bunch and a number of them fall away and one gets to where it needs to go and it transmits the information. And that, that, that sort of raw natural Chow Yuan, that sort of raw natural quality a, a biological principle is then mapped over onto a transmission of civilization principle. And I don't want to say culture because I don't think it's that. I think it's the transmission of it's almost as though he's saying, look, even in the apocalypse, civilization is like a natural formation in in the world, evolved mm -hmm. formation, and it's going to be preserved no matter what happens. Yeah, I agree with you. We just finished uh, the Sunset Limited in literature class. Um, we love reading McCarthy, and um, I wish he did more in the way of short work. But um, yeah, The Road's beautiful. It's the only novel I've ever read that's that's uh, so moved me to tears toward the conclusion. I, I love the way he writes, and and I've read all of his stuff. But that's a recurring theme that 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 notion of. Um, a natural order and a sense of nativity, like you said there, that that's uh, critical to to human, you know, humans, humanity's uh, onward movement, uh, onward march. Um, I just, I don't know, I love the guy, and for being such a nihilist, right, an existentialist, uh, it's it's funny that he has those deep, weighty things. My my students are blown away when they write about the Sunset Limited. Such a philosophical play. I really need to pick up um, both No Country for Old Men and. Um, the road and take a take a read. I think the films yeah. are both brilliant. Watch the HBO Sunset Limited presentation and then mm -hmm. read the play. Really good. Samuel Jackson and, and Tommy Lee Jones. Amazing. Okay. 
I got to get out of here too, though. We ran a little bit long. So thank you all for participating with us today. Thank you so much to everybody who showed up and joined us today. And I uh, hope you come to another LLC event in the future. Have a good afternoon. Hope it's not the end of the world. Just go to the <laughs> about it. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.